Well, hey, what a blessing today to, uh, to have the team, the Iraq team. We're so honored to have you guys. I'm coming too. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to be going and traveling with these guys. And what an honor to have you with us. And, and Sean, what a blessing to have you. Uh, I, think, I think I met Sean in 2008. I remember we had a, a dinner. They were living back here. And, and uh, man, we just we, we had a great time. And I just want to say... Uh, Thank you, Sean, for recognizing the move of God in this season, that this is a move of God when all the voices have yelled, shut down, you said no. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for standing. Thank you for having that John the Baptist type of, I am preparing the way for a move. And Isaiah 40, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. For then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And I believe you've prepared the way for this fresh move of the Spirit of God that this is God actually ushering us into a new season of harvest. And uh, thank you for that. Yeah, so come on up, Sean. Um, I just thought it was so amazing how the Lord led in worship, like that whole fragrance thing, that was just coming out in the moment from the Lord. And I felt like that was so for you guys the whole second Corinthians, like you are a fragrance of Christ in every place. And I, I, we are honored to have you and we are with you and the whole, like what they're specifically called to is worship. And they've just been going around in our nation, worshiping as well as nations around the world. And I connected that really deeply. I had a crazy encounter with God last fall about worship and the worship movement that was coming. And so we welcome that. We're all about that. And worship releases the fragrance of heaven on the earth. And that is what you're doing everywhere you go. And we receive all of that this morning and all you have to bring. Thank you to everyone who's joining live stream. I know we have a lot of people out quarantined and all kinds of crazy stuff, but they're here online. (laughs) And everybody share this so more people can hear because I'm just telling you what you're about to hear is what God is doing in the earth. And it's amazing. And we get to partner with it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come on. Thank you. Wow. What a what an honor to be here. What a privilege. Um, I have, of course, we have our amazing team uh, from Iraq that just heroes and legends. And I want to brag on them too today a little bit, but I have another friend with me here, uh, Barrick from uh, New Orleans, and I just wanted him to come up real quick. The last uh, the last city that we were at on, I think it was the 50th city, uh, was in New Orleans, and um, we rumbled down in the bayou, and we stirred some stuff up down there, but, uh, but it was incredible. You know, we were right there close off of Bourbon Street, and, you know, we've really been focusing in this season on places that people, places and real estate that people think are impossible or too hard or too dark. And if you followed a little bit of our journey, um, it's actually similar to us sending a team of really joyful 20-somethings into a war zone in Iraq. And that's kind of what we've been doing across America this year, going into Portland, Seattle, Chicago, um, of course, all over California where you know, you're not allowed to sing in church. It's pretty funny. Um, And uh, and New Orleans was a place that was on our heart. And I think it's really significant. Um, That's the last city that we were at bringing Let Us Worship to um, before we gather in New Year's on Azusa Street in L.A. And so I thought it'd be really cool for Barrick to just give a testimony as a local pastor in the city of New Orleans. Um, He could share, but the unprecedented unity that we experienced that day in New Orleans was simply historic. I don't know that it's ever happened before in that city. And so 
Everyone just welcome Barrick. He drove up here eight hours. Hey, guys. Man, God has just been so faithful. You know, just looking at the whole Let Us Worship music, uh, you know, just, the, just the, the protest officially. We'll stay official today with the protest, right? Uh, for somebody who's cried out for revival in America for so long, just to see it happening is just absolutely unbelievable to be present. History will reflect this movement as revival, and we can't miss it. We can't miss what the Lord is doing. Amen? Uh, sir, I'm so, just before I jump in, what's your name, sir? Yeah. Daniel, are you, are you a leader here at all? Okay, so I feel like, Daniel, I feel like, um, just before we jump in, I feel like the Lord is bringing a season of total restoration in your life and your family. I feel like I've seen you guys sowing in tears, and I, and I want you to know you're going to reap with joy. Um, and God is developing a platform and a foundation. I feel like you're supposed to have some kind of a, a ministry in something one day. I don't know what it's going to look like. It's different for everybody. But there's definitely like a very special mark on you. Um, and I feel like he's removing just like a sense of, of like the, the self-drive where you have to make it happen. And he's pulling you into a deeper relationship of levels of intimacy that you've never experienced before. You know, that only like your heroes have had. And that everything is going to be birthed from that intimacy. But it's going to be a really special time with you and the Lord, man, where he's going to really bring joy and bring great things into your life. It's going to be very special. So, <laughs> praise God. So, the, the history of New Orleans, you know, um, we have had rifts in the church and the body of Christ for longer than America has been a nation, actually. And when the city was founded, just brief history recap, when the city was founded, um, the Catholic Church sent in missionaries to evangelize into New Orleans. The, the, um, the Baptists found out they sent missionaries surrounding the city to stop the spread of Catholicism from America. So, like, there's been rifts between denominations and churches that go back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So, anyway, in planning this event, of course, you know, like, it's, there, there's so many dynamics. And if you know the area, you would really, you know, it's, it's, I don't have enough time to go into the details of the rifts between the pastors and denominations and all that stuff, the churches. But in planning this event, the Lord just breathed on it just like he's been doing in events across America with Let Us Worship. And people came together, and we stood there right in front of Jackson Square where slaves were brought in who caused rebellions, and they were hung in the open square. It has a very dark history, very dark past. Still today, the voodoo witches and warlocks will actually meet there. They'll bring their clients in to that spot. And they're, they'll perform their voodoo rituals right in front of St. Louis Cathedral, which is the oldest continuously running cathedral in America, church in America. <laughs> so a lot of different dynamics, and, and it was so amazing. So look, as we gathered and we worshiped, just to be present and to see and feel the glory of God begin to fall. The glory of God begin to fall in that moment in that place with those people and those pastors. History was made. History was made. We had a gentleman who had, he was an older gentleman. He had back pain in his right hip, and the Lord healed him. We had a young lady who had problems in her spine. She had an accident, and she couldn't turn her head since the accident, and God healed her, and she was moving her head. We had drug addicts who were homeless who came, who were walking past the event, and heard the gospel presented and came up and gave their lives to the Lord, weeping before the Lord, worshiping before the Lord. And I could go on and on. And I think, I think as many miracles and salvations as we saw, as incredible as the moment was, I think the unity among the churches was like probably the most precious and special thing that was there. It was unbelievable. I talked to one older gentleman who's a pastor. He's been a pastor for decades in the area. He said, I haven't seen anything like this. He said, the closest thing I saw happened 50 years ago in the city, but it was, it was nothing like to this level, but it's the closest thing that I can compare. And I was standing there worshiping, and I'm thinking, there is not one person here who was under 50 who has ever seen anything like this in their entire lives in this city. 
just a breakthrough, amen? God is moving, and like I said, listen, history will reflect this as a revival and a mighty move of the Spirit of God across this nation. And so, look, we get to be a part of it. We don't, we don't want to miss it. Listen, I'm not missing this thing. We're not, you're not going to miss it. God's doing something great, amen? He really is. Come on. Amen. Thank you. Wow. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. 2020, the book of Revelation. Ka, ka, ka. <laughs> uh, when we were praying, you know, we were going to all these, these coastal cities, New York, uh, Boston, uh, New Jersey, L.A., and then I really felt like that we were, like, God, I don't know, God was just moving on my heart in Texas, and, um, and it, you know, we were going to come, and a big part of that actually had to do with the, with the, uh, the journey to Washington, D.C. that I felt like needed to go through Texas because of the Roe v. Wade ruling in Dallas, and I won't unpack all that stuff, but um, and so it was like we, we felt like we were supposed to come and, and do a worship thing in the Metroplex, and then I learned that these guys had already been doing it in the park. I was like, of course they have, you know. So we'll just come pour fire on what's already burning, and that was a very significant. How many guys were there that night in the park? That was such a significant. We're, uh, we're, we're right now, we're, um, we've been trying to capture, do our best to really capture um, all of these different cities and the sounds that have come from them. And so I was listening back to the raw, because uh, we're mixing the, it's going to be the Texas record, so it's going to include Fort Worth, Dallas, and Kerrville. Um, and we were down there in Kerrville where that m giant cross is, which was wild because right in the middle of us being down there was this massive butterfly, uh, yeah, migration. It was like, what is happening? You know, and we're here at this giant cross and there's butterflies. Talk about revelation. I mean, it was like crazy. Um, but I was listening back to the Fort Worth night, and I'm like, man, that was just so profound. And then the power went off, but the people didn't. And uh, it was just amazing. So I really, I can't wait for you guys to hear that. It's going to come out probably the first week in January. Um, but I, I um, there's so many layers of significance of being here. And I'm, this is probably my last sermon. I haven't really been, pre I haven't been in churches a lot, mostly been outside. Um, so this is maybe my third time in a church this year, and I wanted to, probably this is the last time I'm able to share, and I wanted to actually end it where it began for me, which is in Revelation 1, and so in 2019, the last Sunday of 2019, I was in New York City, and I was preaching at this church on Wall Street, and I had been fasting that week saying, Lord, I want a word for 2020, like every year I, we fast, and we pray, and we press, and we, you know, I feel like I get a word, well, I didn't, I, I had been praying and fasting, and I just was getting nothing, you know. I was getting no words, no clarity. You know, I'm like, it's 2020, you know. Get, like, give me a word about focus or seeing things clearly or something, you know. And I just was so frustrated because I wasn't getting anything. And the only thing the Lord gave me, and this was the sermon that I preached, was out of Revelation 1. And I didn't see the pandemic and the insanity, I don't think anybody did. I mean, I think <laughs> some of us kind of like, I, uh, I, I, I kind of like mess with some of my prophetic friends. I'm like, hey, um, maybe we should press in a little bit harder for the next year so we can really like, like we, we can't just regurgitate words. Like we got to find out what is God actually saying, you know. Um, I just kind of mess with them. I'm like, I don't know where your prophetic meter's at, bro, but um I think the whole world got blindsided by this. It would have been nice to have some warning, you know. Um, and, and, but the last sermon that I preached was out of Revelation 1, and it was this really interesting verse that I had never really studied before. But it, it was this whole concept of John being on the island, being excommunicated, quarantined, I guess you could say now, uh, from everybody, and he starts getting a download in a revelation of the end days, right? I mean, he didn't ask for it. He wasn't looking for it, but the Lord positioned him to begin to receive literally the most intensely <laughs> dynamic 
insane picture of what was going to happen at the end of the age. And so he's sitting there and he begins, the, the download begins initially with just the revelation of Jesus. It's a pretty good place to start. You know, and so he sees this vision. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he sees this vision. And, and how many of you guys in, in 2020 have, like, you've woken up and you're, like, flipping through Revelation, like, which page are we on today? <laughs> you know, um, he sees this intense revelation, this intense vision of Jesus, and he goes through, and his hair was like this, and he was glistening, and his eyes were flames of fire, his feet were gleaming with bright metal, and da-da-da-da-da, and his voice was roaring like the might of many waters, and he goes through this whole revelation, and then he just gets so overwhelmed. Anybody been overwhelmed this year? I mean, I have a pretty high capacity for not being overwhelmed, but when schools shut down, we had to homeschool four kids. We, I hit the overwhelmed meter really, really high. Um, but it's interesting. It says that he, he, he gets so overwhelmed by the initial revelation of seeing Jesus. And you got to wonder, God's going like, dude, we're not even done with chapter one yet. You're already overwhelmed and we're not even like close to the end. You haven't seen the bulls poured out. You haven't seen the, the, the horses running through the river of blood. I mean, you, there's a lot coming, right? There's, there's a lot that's about to happen, and you are so overwhelmed. And it, it's like, and the kindness of, of, of God, I just love the kindness of the Lord. It's like, I mean, he doesn't think like we think. He doesn't get angry on Facebook and Twitter and rail on us, you know? It's like he, he doesn't troll, you know? He he has so much compassion and so much desire, and I think back to all the verses, like kind of the staple verses that that we used in the burn back in the day. When even when we came through here, when we lived in Dallas, you know, uh, the, the the like, did our hearts not burn? You know, and you have the men on the road to Emmaus that knew Jesus. They walked with him. They saw his miracles. They knew his sermons, and yet they forgot. That in the greatest day of breakthrough and victory, they were depressed and disappointed and discouraged. And then Jesus appeared to them to say, hey, what are you guys bummed about? And they said, oh, this guy was going to come, and then he ended up dying. And they're talking to Jesus. They're living in the greatest day in human history that's ever existed. And they're so depressed and so bummed. And I mean, Jesus is like, dude, I've given three years of my life to you idiots. But instead of smiting them, he teaches them again about himself. As he walked on the road, it says he began to teach them the scriptures again. Like the long-suffering, the patience, the kindness of God. Right? And, and so we have this moment here where, where instead of like rebuking John for not having the capacity to see what's happening. He says, oh, and he comes and it says in verse, I'm going to read this out of the Passion. It says in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell down as at his feet as good as dead, but he laid his right hand on me and I heard his reassuring voice saying, don't yield to fear. I am the beginning and I am the end. The living one. I was dead, but now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys that unlock death and the unseen world. And then he again gives him his mandate. I want you to write what you have seen. I want you to write what I'm revealing to you. But he begins with the statement, don't yield to fear. This was all the Lord gave me in 2019, last Sunday. New York City. And then when the pandemic broke and New York was like going crazy, it was like the epicenter of COVID and the churches were, you know, people were freaking out and things were crazy. I did a Zoom call with, in New York. This is the first time I remembered it. It was, I think, in April or May. And the church said, we want you to do a Zoom call. I'm like, for what? They're like, for the, your word for New York. I'm like, I, I don't really have a word for New York. No, They said, no, the last sermon that you preached in New York of 2019 We've been spreading it around the city, the don't yield to fear part. I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah, totally, cool. Yeah, yeah, that was prophetic, you know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I had to go back and listen to it. I was like, oh, my gosh, don't yield to fear. 
Don't yield to fear. I am the beginning of the end. In other words, don't yield to fear. I'm the author of the story. And I feel like if if anything's been tested in 2020, it's our response and our reaction to fear. Any amens out there? I mean, it's just like this is the culture right now. It's like, good night. I was walking in. I don't know if I was in Costco or something the other day, and I was there with my, my kids. I mean, good God. I have a... 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 6-year-old, and a 2-year-old. And you, you want me to try to keep a mask on a 2- and 6-year-old. Good luck. You know, and my 6-year-old is just rambunctious and wild and fun, and masks falls everywhere, and they're grabbing. And by the way, the, you know, just, you know, my whole family are doctors, so just, so you know, the moment that you touch your mask, it doesn't work. Right? I mean... The moment that you touch it, I mean, this is the hardest thing for surgeons to learn in medical school, is they literally, you can't touch your mask. And of course, their kids are moving it everywhere. And and I'm like, well, a lot of good that did, you know. But my six-year-old has it like below his nose. It's like barely below his nose. And we're walking in Costco and these, you know, freaked out mid 20 year olds that have a 99.9999999999% of surviving see my 6 year old with his mask barely below his nose and they, ah! you know they freak out and run over to the corner and I'm like good lord help us you know but it's just like and I'm not saying it's not real and people aren't losing I'm not saying this is not a a, a thing on that but I'm just saying that there's there's a paranoid there's, there's an abnormal spirit of fear that is gripping the world right now. You know, and politicians use it to leverage their campaigns. And economic, you know, economists use it to leverage their thing. And people use it to leverage the vaccine. Whatever. Everyone's playing into this dynamic of fear. And I feel like, like, like. The word that the Lord gave me, I feel like that, that we're in a season right now, like we have to remember, regardless of what comes, regardless of what unfolds, we have this promise, don't yield to fear. Why? Because I'm the author of the story. And you guys know this, if it's not good yet, it's not the end. Amen? Turn to Isaiah 9. I want to read this, and then we're going to, I think we're going to do some prophetic ministry this morning. I know I could use some prophetic ministry. We have an amazing team here. And um, by the way, this book, Brazen, um, I, I'm going to do, I haven't actually done this ever um, because I haven't been in church really much. Uh, but I'm going to sign some of these out there if you want to get one before today. This is really a prophetic precursor. And this church is actually in this book. Didn't realize that till last night um, in a, an incredible encounter that we had uh, when we did a burn, we did 24 hours of worship and prayer here when me and my wife were living in the, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And we had a really profound moment. Where was that? E- what Was that in the sanctuary or was that? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. In the prayer room. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and I we had an incredible encounter there. Um, and it actually started with going like, what, am, what are we doing here? What are we why, why, do, why are we gathered here praying through the night? We had been on this journey for a couple of years, but I was hit with this cynical thing like, are we really doing anything? Are we really changing anything? Is anything really shifting in the world? And then I saw the, this perspective from heaven of us capturing the attention of the Father in that little prayer room over there. And I felt the Lord say this, and I wrote it in the book. The Lord said, you have my attention. And in that moment, I knew that everything that we said and that we prayed in that little room, that little prayer room over there was going to happen in the spirit. And so anyway, it, it's really cool. I'm going to be on Daystar, like five of their shows tomorrow. That's one of the reasons I'm here talking about this and, and other things. But I have some copies there today, and so you can get one. But uh, Isaiah 9, this is my favorite. My, I'm going to jump this on the back of the Revelation 1. Because this is the Christmas, glory, explosion, gospel, joy, good news. You don't have any reason to be depressed in this season type of a passage. And I thought it would be good to read this and remind. I never knew in my life 
that God would use a global pandemic and an irrational spirit of fear to birth one of the wildest worship movements I've ever been a part of. I mean, and we're talking like, we're talking about mobilization on a level that doesn't even make sense. I mean, what started on a bridge in San, Fr San Francisco the day after we got this crazy ruling from our tyrannical governor, you can't sing in church, which is not only against our faith as believers, it's against the constitution of our nation. And, you know, there were so many people, God bless their hearts, that were just in compliant mode. And I'm like, listen, we spent our time in the Middle East. We spent our time in, with the, you know, the persecuted nations of the world. I mean, these, you know, and, and I'm, I'm on what's up, you know, secure messaging my friends in Saudi Arabia. Hey, man, what do you think we should do? They're like, what do you mean what do you think you should do? Gather and worship. Do it like we do. You know, and, and I was like, okay, okay. And so I had them all, like, send me these prophetic messages. It was like all of my years of pouring into the persecuted church, now they were pouring back into me in this season. It was really, really wild. And so we gathered um, on a bridge in San Francisco, didn't know if anyone was going to come. Everything's closed down, and we 400 people show up. Pastors, leaders from different denominations, different ethnicities, and we, get on, we got on that bridge I think it was in June, and we just began to prophesy, and I felt like the Lord said, hey, it's time to say some crazy things. It's time to pray with crazy faith. It's time to make bold declarations and prophecies, and so we got our, you know, our bullhorns out. We had one speaker that was battery powered that we set up there. The wind was howling on the Golden Gate Bridge. We marched to the middle of it. I mean, listen, if there's ever a time for Christians to be weird... 2020 is it. I mean, it's like, it's time. It, it really is. And it's like, I'm beginning to realize, like, we, and, and even me, like, I got into two modes to where it was like, I could hang in the wildness of the persecuted church, third world, craziness, you know, spontaneous, organic flow. But then when I came in America, it was like I got in the American flow. We're cool, church. We're relevant. Even movie stars can understand and like us. You know, it's like, it's like so weird. And I just feel like the Lord, part of the grace of the Lord in 2020 was like, uh, all those cool buildings and all your LED screens and all your tricks and all your, I mean, this is like Dallas-Fort Worth is like the, the, the hub. You know, uh, you can't go in any of those anymore. And you need to go to the park. You need to go get a little more Jesus, Jesus movement vibes back. You need to go get a little bohemian, <laughs> a little hippie. You know, when I started studying, it was cool because when we finished our thing on the Golden Gate Bridge, my pastor, uh, Bill Johnson, called me and he said, hey, I have something I feel like I'm supposed to give you. I went to his house, and it was the original 1972 Life magazine from Dallas. And it was, the, it, was the, it was the famous moment where the Jesus People movement went viral because they put it on the cover of Life magazine. And it's the picture of the guy with the curly hair, the hippie guy on the shoulders of another guy, on the shoulders of another guy. It's like three guys on shoulders. Do you remember that image? And they had the one-way T-shirt which we have out there, you can get, like, I was like, we're going full Jesus people movement, let's make the shirt, let's go for it, you know? And in that issue of Life magazine, it talks about the Jesus people movement, and it was a really iconic, powerful moment in the 70s because Billy Graham came to Dallas, and everyone was like, these crazy hippies, you know, and the Jesus people movement, and people are getting baptized in the Pacific Ocean, and it's so weird and so strange, and Billy Graham showed up in Dallas to be the main speaker at their gathering, bringing validation to the church at large that this is a move of God, and it happened in 1972 in Dallas, Texas, and so uh, Bill gave me that copy of that magazine, and I just remember going back home and just flipping through the pages and just like weeping, just being like, God, I want to see this in my generation. 
And who knew that God didn't cause the global pandemic, but that he would use it to push the church out of where they were comfortable out into the streets, out into fill the city. I mean, like Barrick's talking about 3,000 wild people in New Orleans. I mean, they didn't even know what to do with us. 6,000 people in Portland. I mean, the Portland police were calling me, hey, you know, like the, the Antifa guys are going to show up and they're dangerous and we can't protect you. And I said, bro, that's great. A couple Antifa guys can show up. We have thousands of Christians like thousands of Christians, and it was wild to see like the Antifa guys that were used to like, oh, we're going to go mess with like 100 people. And I'm like, yeah, there's 6,000 people. And we had some big old boys too. <laughs> we had some people that were packing, so we were covered. But, but in all of these cities, it was just phenomenal to see the hunger and the desire and the 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 how how this season has crushed us to the point where we're like we got to have revival or bust it's our only hope for the nation it's our only hope for racial reconciliation it's our only hope for salvation it's our only hope you know and there was something about the pressing of this season that we pre it, it caused us to become desperate again for Jesus I mean, a couple weeks ago, 10,000 people showed up in Arizona. We changed the venue. We didn't have all the language right. Da, 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 and 10,000 people still showed up. And the police showed up too, and we were so pumped because we had them come on stage. We began to prophesy over them, and they're in the back there, the police, you know, on the video, getting down with it in worship. Um, I mean, it's just incredible what the Lord was doing what the Lord did and how he was able to use this season of that seemed so devastating to bring unprecedented unity, historic, uh, uh, a, a historic cross-denominational, cross, -denominational, cross I mean, we saw so much racial reconciliation. I can't even tell you how many crazy protesters showed up to all of these cities and they end up getting saved. <laughs> Satanist showing up, getting saved. It's the power of the gospel. Isaiah chapter 9, it says this. Verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. So I think this is 500 years, maybe more, 500 years before so Isaiah's in, in such a prophetic swirl. He starts prophesying about the coming of Jesus. Like hundreds of years before it's going to happen. So there's no context here. He starts prophesying about the coming of Jesus. And by the way, if you talk to Jews about Jesus, this is a great place to start. Because it's very clear in this passage that he's prophesying about the coming of Jesus as a baby. Can you imagine getting into this place where you're, I mean, David has several moments of this too, where you're so caught up in worship in the presence that you start prophesying something that's going to happen in 500 years? <laughs> and it says, the people walking in the darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. This is the first prophecy of Isaiah about the coming of Jesus and listen to what marks this prophetic word there's some there's some common threads that are right here it says you have enlarged the nation and increased their a little bit louder they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder Joy, 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 joy. How do you know it's Jesus? Joy, 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 joy. I mean, I was like never an obnoxious, hype, joy songwriter, but in 2020, that's all we're writing. Every song is let's dance and party. Every city we go into, rioting, looting, destruction. Hey, I got an idea. Let's dance and party. 
There's something about the coming of the kingdom of God. It has to be marked by joy. This is why in 2020, one of the most profound moves God's doing in the church is he's causing us, he's, he's removing the grumpiness off of Christians. He's removing the irritability off of Christians. He's removing the anger, the irritation, because for a lot of us, for a long time, we've been really bad at marketing the gospel. <laughs> and I've been guilty of that too. I mean, there's things, man, I mean, I ran, for crying out loud, I ran for Congress as a conservative in California. There's not a lot more things when you're on that journey. I mean, you can get pretty angry about certain things. But I began to realize as we started going to these cities, the breakthrough that took place always happened in the place of joy. I mean, this is what confounded. I mean, we had one of the most famous videos. I love it so much. This, this very well-known protester in Seattle, okay, in, in CHOP. You guys remember CHOP, the autonomous zone? This is not America, you know, whatever. And they, they, they just let him do it. They were like, okay, you know. And so when the Lord called us to go into Seattle, I'm like, we need to go into CHOP. The pastors were calling me, why would you do that? You're going to, people are, you know, there's no police protection there, and it's dark there, and it's hard there, and people are crazy there. And I'm like, that's exactly why we're going. <laughs> we got to break this self-preservation gospel of it's safety, 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 safety. You know, Jesus said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, and all of you are going to die for me. It's going to be awesome. High five. And the gospel in America has been like protection, safety, be careful. Don't send 20-year-olds out to a war zone. It's very weird. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if it's dark, bring the light. If they're sick, bring healing. That's a big one for this year. Well, what would Jesus do? He would stay home. No, he would not. People that say that Jesus would stay at home in quarantine, good night, need a crash course in theology. He angered people because he walked into the sickness, into the leper camps, into the place, the untouchables, no one else would go. And here we're dealing with things that are far less lethal. <laughs> People are jumping off of bridges in America. The suicide rates in many states and cities is far higher than the COVID death rates. The mental anguish that's upon people, the levels of crisis happening in children. I mean, thank God my children are in a home full of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit. And so every disappointment we turn around. But the average child that hasn't been able to go to soccer and hasn't been able to go to school and hasn't been able to go. I mean, it's difficult. We need the church now more than ever. I told y'all I haven't been in churches in a while, so sorry. Um, oh, so this famous protester, he, uh, he, his videos go viral, right? Because he gets right in the middle of everything, and, and there's a YouTube channel that he uses. And, and, and if you want to see what's going on in CHOP, if you want to see what's happening with the protest, everybody follows this guy. So he happened to show up, and I think his, I would read his handle or his name, but I think it's like full of, ex, you know, curse words, at blah, 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 blah. But anyway, so this guy shows up when we come and we worship, and we have about two to 3,000 people there. And he shows up, and he's like trying to cause disturbance. He's trying to he's trying to stop what we're doing. He's annoyed that we're there and that some people don't have masks and that whatever and it's like you know, it's like okay, you can burn the whole city down, but when Christians gather to worship, you got to watch out, you know. And so he gets there and he's he's like get, gets up on this high place and he's videoing us and he's on his live stream and he's saying, "I don't understand what's wrong with these people." The more angry I get at them, the more happy they become. He goes, what is wrong with them? He's like, we try to turn the power off. We try to shut them down. We try to do this, and they just keep getting more happy. He's literally on his live stream, which I found his live stream and reposted it, you know. It was just an awesome picture of this where it's like, it's like, 
You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressors. For to us a child is born. This is what I share when I'm in Israel. It says, it says for us a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Yes, I want them to figure out the legal votes counted. Yes, I want them to figure this whole thing out. Yes, I, I am concerned. I love ele election integrity, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, I don't really care. We know who's on the throne. I'm not going to lose sleep. The kingdom of God will prevail. I don't care who's in the White House. It doesn't matter who's in Congress. You're talking to somebody that ran for a political position. So yes, I am concerned in different ways. But at the, at the end of the day, we know who's on the throne. We know who's in control. We know who's writing the story. So we don't have to give in to the fear-mongering narratives. We can live in a place where we know God has got this. Turn to someone and say, he's got this. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. There will be no end. It only increases. It doesn't diminish. It only increases. Look at the evangelization of the world. Look at what ha has happened across the earth. The gospel's only increased. Times get more difficult. It increases more. Persecution ramps up. It increases more. Big tech censorship. It increases more. I mean, I just laugh at these big tech guys. Because I'm involved with those conversations with senators, and I'm just like, these guys are funny. Like, they think they can literally censor the gospel? Like, wake up to 2,000 years of church history. It doesn't matter your algorithm, bro. Like, the gospel's going to prevail. Like, it will prevail. You can try to remove his name. You can try. People have been doing that for years. But, dude, you are in the wrong you're, you're on the wrong track because it will prevail. It doesn't need your Google algorithm to be bumped up to the top. It's still the good news. The kingdom of God will go forth. And that's not to say there isn't some dark people doing some dark stuff. There is. But at the end of the day, we're sitting on this prophetic promise. The greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Every year we can look at the next year and say it's going to get better. My wife always laughs at me. She's like, you know, every year we, uh, we approach like this and we pray about it. And she's like, what are you going to get this year? And I'm just like, you know, I've just been really praying. And I just think we're going to do more stuff. She's like, you say that every year. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know, but I just really feel like there's an increase. She's like, you said increase every year. I'm like, yeah, I just feel like, the, you know, that. We're going to do this in this nation. We're going to go here and we're going to do this. I think we're going to go more places. She's like, yeah, that's awesome. She's like, that's the same thing you've said every year we've been married for 15 years. But it really is. It's true. Of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Joy, 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 joy. Joy, 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 joy. You know, Isaiah... Imagine that moment where he just released this word, and he's probably just laughing. Laughing about the fact that he's envisioning a baby that's coming into the world that's going to be the biggest joy bomb the earth has ever seen. And the first prophetic word about baby Jesus coming to planet earth has four times joy in it. Just think about that. 
I mean, we are at a place in America right now where we need a baptism of Holy Ghost joy. We, uh, we, we, um, I've had a lot of intensity this year, of course, and, um, I mean, I'm not surprised by anything anymore. We've been written about with hit articles in literally every publication that you can, lies and slandering. And at first, I was like, oh, man, that's intense. And But I have some really good friends that are geniuses, and they just, every time somebody wrote something, they were like, man, this is awesome. We're so pumped. CNN tried to crush you, but they don't realize that they're only furthering the spread of this thing. And we noticed with every negative article and every negative press conference that things just got bigger. <laughs> and, uh, and so then we got home the other day, and we're just, like, we're just like waiting. We just like, after 50 cities and the intensity and all the, all the things and, 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 you know, living in California and, and not even being able to have community and church there because everything shut down and, we got home, we're like, oh, at least we got the holidays to be together, and at least we can just revamp together as a family and regroup and do our Christmas deals, and I walk in, and <clears throat> our uh, our hardwood floors are like, the the under part of our hardwood floors in our kitchen are all turned up like there's, like, moisture or something on it, but there's no moisture, and I'm like, what's happening, and so I start digging around, and I find this crazy leak in our kitchen from a pipe that broke that's been happening for the a week nonstop since we'd been gone. And so I had to call my insurance company and found out that all, you know, all of our hardwood floors and all of our cabinets in our entire kitchen has to be gutted. <laughs> and so literally they didn't even give me an option because I called them. I'm like, all of a sudden, like three guys show up and they just take our stove out and they take our oven out and they take all of our stuff out. And me and Kate are standing there in our kitchen going, what is happening? And they're like, yeah, we have to take everything out. Everything has to go. Everything has to be redone. And I'm like, we have nowhere to go. Thanksgiving's in like two days. And I'm like, God, this is so typical 2020. Just wanted to be at home in our kitchen, you know. It was like, it was like, and so I, I, I was getting so bummed and mad. And I felt like the Lord said, hey, like, just get your guitar out. Get your kids together. Have a party. You know, and so we did. That night we got together. We got the guitar out. We just sang of God's goodness. And I know it's like such a first world thing. It's, it's a kitchen or whatever. But it was just like, it's been, <laughs> if you've had those experiences this year where it's just been one thing after another, after another, after another. And we got the guitar out and we just started to worship and, you know, and then of course I had this 10-year-old prophetic unicorn daughter that speaks the word of the Lord every time she prays. And she was praying and she was like, we don't even need a kitchen, we just need you, Jesus, and I'm like crying, and I'm like, you're right, Katura. <laughs> we just need you, Jesus, you know. And, and it, we totally refocus as a family. But, but what really has been getting us through the, 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 the intensity of this year has been our joy meter, where it's like we have to be intentional to go into the secret place to get with Jesus and to find this place of joy. And if we do, it's amazing what it does in our life, in our marriage, in our family. And my kids are going to look back on 2020 and the, I don't, I mean, I don't know how much they're going to remember the pandemic. I know they're going to remember going to Fort Worth and worshiping their faces off with thousands of people in the park. I know they're going to remember seeing signs and wonders and miracles. I know they're going to remember the craziness of going to these cities and watching God show up again and again and again. It's almost like the Lord's rebranded this whole season. And I just feel like for us going into a new year, we have to be launched from this place of overwhelming joy. That the kingdom is advancing. Nothing can stop the spread of an unstoppable kingdom. We're a part of it. We get to see it happen in our cities, in our communities, in our lives. And if there's one thing I can tell you about America right now, I have never seen more people in this nation hungry for Jesus than right now. And I can speak with a little bit of perspective, having gone to so many places. People want Jesus. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. 
They're looking for people that won't be shaken. Amen. And so we want to do some, some, maybe if we get the band to come up here, I want to pray. And then if you want to receive um, ministry, like, I, I don't know, I, I, I know that you guys have more services until the new year, but I feel like that, um, what's the date today? I, December 6th. I feel like there's a recalibration period for this house and for people where the Lord, like, wants to get you out of the cycles of anxiety and discouragement and he wants to like recalibrate you to get ready to run in the new season you know like this is a season this is a season of dynamic breakthrough and i i do believe the lord's going to use your church i believe it's prophetic that you guys were down there in the park you know i was calling i was calling a lot of my friends across the metroplex and i have a lot of friends that are pastors and i'm like I'm like, open up, you know, and they're like, well, I don't know, and I'm like, go outside, well, where we go, go to a street corner, I don't care, gather and worship, find a place, well, we don't know, we don't have permits, I'm like, we never get permits, just gather, well, I don't know, well, just call it, then call it a protest, well, I don't know if we want to call it, I was like, no, it's easy, call it a protest, what are you protesting, you're protesting that heaven would come to the earth, it's very simple, Literally, you're protesting that this place would look like that place. And so we started saying that, literally. Like, it, like we would go to cities, and they would be like, I remember the first one was Milwaukee. The police showed up, and they were like, you guys can't do this. You don't have a permit, you don't have whatever. Meanwhile, they have whatever. Um, and I was like, well, they were like, you can't do this. You need a permit. And I was like, well, what if I were to tell you that we're protesting? And they were like, the cops were like, oh, that's different. And I was like, and I looked at them, there's three of them. There's three, three Milwaukee police officers standing there. And I was like, they're like, oh, that's different. I'm like, well, yeah, we're protesting. <laughs> pretty much. I said, pretty much. And I have this, this, uh, this, this black guy, Charles, that we've been running together. And, uh, and, and we've been doing racial reconciliation. We've been going after healing and all this stuff. And I'm like, Charles, get up here. Tell them we're protesting. Charles comes up and he goes, yeah, we're, we're protesting. That's what we're doing here. And they were like, okay. And they were like, you know, what are you protesting? And I was like, well, we're protesting that Milwaukee would look like heaven. We're protesting that peace would come back to the streets of this city. We're protesting that the kingdom of God would be made manifest. We're protesting that racial reconciliation and healing would take place on the streets. And they were just blown away. They were just standing there looking at us. They're like, and then they ended up going, okay. Well, we'll protect your protest. And, uh, but really, I mean, this is a season and, and, and God wants to stir up a spirit of boldness and courage, you know, where, where we, can, we can unapologetically bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. I feel like a lot of people, they, they feel like they have to build their case and their argument or they have to get approval or they have to get whatever. Man, this is all the approval you need. He said, go do the stuff. Well, the trolls are going to come after us. Yeah, they will. That's okay. Sometimes they just validate the fact that you're doing something for God. I mean, you got to have some resistance, right? It's so good for Americans to have resistance. We were in Washington, D.C., and we gathered almost 40,000 people, and I was so bummed because... I was praying that it wouldn't rain. I'm like, you know, we're looking at the at the weather. I'm like, it's not going to rain. And I was like, excited. And then two days before it started, it's like this random front moved in. And I'm like, oh, gosh, it's going to rain. It's going to be 45 degrees. I heard the Lord say, no, nah, this is good for America. Get out there in the rain, in the cold. So we gathered. We started the day in the morning on the steps of the Supreme Court. The day before the confirmation of ACB, we had the largest prayer meeting in the history of the United States in front of the Supreme Court. 9,000 people in the rain. And I was there and we were worshiping and the rain was coming down and all of our guitars were getting wet and Lou Angle was up there with me. <sighs> 
we were worshiping, and it was so good. And, 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 and just the, the gritty rawness of the gospel, the pressing into Jesus. I mean, this is the season we're in. Comfortability is out the window. We just want his presence. Amen. And so I want to pray over you guys. I want to, I want to first, um, before we do that, and we'll go into some ministry and worship, but I'll, I want to pray over this incredible team that's here from Iraq. Can we just give it up for them again? And why don't you guys just stand up? And I want us to extend our hands to them. Um, all this year they've been serving Jesus in a very, very difficult place. They've had to deal with quarantine restrictions. They've had to deal with, you know, not ha always having access to the refugees and things are starting to open up again. And, and But they've been so faithful to waste their lives, the early years of their lives on some of the most unreached and marginalized people on the face of the earth. You know, social justice and, you know, the social justice warriors and going after justice, the people that sit in coffee shops drinking $6 lattes and tweet about social justice, well, these guys are actually doing it. <laughs> they live in the Middle East. They live in a war zone. They're doing the very things that I believe are the heart cry of a generation. And I believe this is just a, 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 a prophetic picture of an entire generation that's going to take the joy of the gospel. Because this is some of the most joyful people you've ever met. I mean, you live in the Middle East for a couple years, it's hard to keep your joy. They've kept their joy. So I want to pray over them. Just extend your hand. Lord, we just thank you for sending these heroes of the faith to us today. God, we thank you for all that they're putting their hand to. We thank you for their dedication, their courage, their resilience, their joy. Lord, we thank you, God, for their, for their determination to keep pressing on and to keep coming up with strategies and innovations to reach these people with the fame of your name. Lord, we just pray a refreshing in this season. We pray a baptism of hope. We, to pray, we pray that you would remove all discouragement, all anxiety, all question marks, God, that you would fill them afresh and anew. Lord, we pray from this church, from this house, we pray a new commissioning for a new season. Lord, that you would launch them from Fort Worth, Texas, God, from this well of worship and revival, that they would be launched back into the Middle East in 2021 with more fire than they've ever had in their whole life. We pray, God, for an energy and a momentum and an acceleration. Lord, we pray that you would double the size of their team in the new year. Double the size of their budget. Let them be, uh, be, be magnets that attract resources from heaven to do the work of the kingdom. And I pray over them an ability to dream like they've never had before. Not just survive, not just surviving, but thriving. The dreams of God over the Kurdish peoples, the dreams of God over the Yazidi people, the dreams of God over the Iraqi people, the Syrians, the Iranians, the Turks. Lord, we pray, give them dreams of your heart for the people groups that are there in that nation. Give them an inheritance of the gospel of the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here and you just want to get baptized with fresh joy and courage. I just want to invite you to come up front here as we worship. I want to pray over you. If that's you and you just you just want that baptism, I'm going to be out in the back. If you want to get a book on your way out, I'll be there signing. But I want to just pray. <laughs> and we're going to release our, some of our team that's here. They're going to go around and just pray for people. I just feel like the Lord gave me this word that um, that God is making the people in this church billboards of joy. 
Like, you know, when you, when you drive down the interstate and there's certain billboards that stick out because they're usually the most annoying ones. They have lights around them or they're bright colored. You are the annoying billboard of joy. You're like, you're like the perpetual, you know, the movie Elf, <laughs> Will Ferrell. You're like that. Like just obnoxiously filled with the kingdom of God. Everywhere you go, you just leak out that fragrance and that joy. Every, every store that you go into, every, every place that you drive, every person that you encounter encounters the joy that's on your life in this season. Lord, I pray, just lift your hands. Lord, we pray, God, for a baptism of the joy of the gospel. In a season of such destruction and despair and hopelessness and discouragement, Lord, I pray that you would give these people the opposite spirit. Lord, that they would be baptized in the opposite spirit, one of hope, one of life, one of joy. Lord, I pray, God, that it would be so outrageous. It would be a joy beyond their circumstances, beyond their bank accounts beyond even what their future looks like. Many of them don't even know what is coming in the new year, but God, you're giving them an expectation. I just feel like even right now, like God wants to birth in you an expectation. Like an expectation of something to come, something that you're excited about. A lot of you haven't felt that in a while. Feelings of excitement and expectation. A giddiness that you're about to unwrap the greatest presence of your life in this season. And I just speak that testimony. When I finished my congressional race and I didn't win and I blew up my entire life, I was so bummed. I'm like, what the heck have I done? And the Lord, I just, every time I went and prayed, the Lord was just laughing and he says, you don't even know what's to come. All you have to do is be obedient. And so I just declare that over you. All you have to do is be obedient. What's coming, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what is in store. God, bless this church, bless this house, bless this community. Fill them, God, with a great anticipation and expectation of this incredible season of gospel and kingdom advancement to come. Come on, let's just worship. Let's sing a little bit before we end today. Come on, just lift your voice. Come on, let's just lift our voice. Come on, let it rise. Let the faith rise in your heart. Let it rise in your spirit. you're doing. We just want to say yes to you. We want to say yes to, to not uh, resisting what you're doing. And we don't even, we don't want to just tolerate what you're doing. We want to be on the front line. And we just are signed up for that as a people, as a church, as a house. Lord, we know that throughout history, Revival has been resisted by much of the church. And we just want to say that we're in, we're signed up, Lord. Whatever it looks like, it will stretch us, it will break us, it is going to take everything. But we say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes. 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 So, Father, thank you for the new boldness. Thank you for the new strength. Thank you for what you're releasing over us, God. We thank you, Father, for a new joy that is coming into our lives, that we're going to be marked with joy in this city. Lord, we pray, we pray, God, that you would make us the most joyful people in this city, that there would be so much joy that people would be wondering what is wrong with us. <laughs> Lord, I pray that it would be absolutely contagious. We bless you for it, Lord.